land steward community education series. These are open to anybody, as you all know, who are joining, but sometimes folks think you have to be a land steward to do these classes. You can um, find them by just Googling OSU Land Steward and we come up on the web. And if you scroll down on the website to this orange bar um, and click this join uh, check, then you can sign up for our email list to hear about upcoming events. That's really all that comes across on that email list. I have also been coached to mention our YouTube channel where we have hosted a lot of these classes that we presented since the pandemic. We are getting a really nice catalog of classes. So there are lots of interesting things there to kind of bone up on if you're all out of Netflix options and you want to learn more about land stewardship topics. Um, if you go to the website, um, if you search us and go to the website and you go to events, you'll see up other upcoming things that we have. And we. We, this week we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday classes. So now we're down to Gordon tonight. And then the next thing on the calendar that's all prepared is um, a wildflower walk on the East Applegate Ridge Trail, which I'll be leading. And that will be fun. So think about joining that. But we have a lot of other things coming up in the works. Um, and then Managing Forest and Changing Climate is offered by some of our other forestry partners. So this evening we have Resilient Pastures with Gordon Jones. Gordon Jones is Extension Agriculture faculty member at Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center. He holds a BS in Environmental Studies and Sustainable Agriculture from Warren College, Warren Wilson College, and an MS and PhD in Crop and Soil Environmental Sciences from Virginia Tech. Gordon is passionate about sharing his knowledge of the integrated management of plant and soil systems, and he has some other classes that are in our catalog if you want to see more from Gordon after tonight. So with that. I I will stop my share and turn it over to Gordon. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, delighted to be with you all this evening. Glad to see a good crowd and some names that I recognize or I think I recognize here on the here on the Zoom grid. Um, I was telling Rachel earlier that there's like a 60% chance that my internet cuts out this evening just because um, even though I'm wired in to this fancy university network and have a uh, excellent laptop here. Um, it's been behaving sketchily. And as I was saying that to Rachel, it happened twice in the course of about three minutes. And so if I uh, dip out for a moment, my apologies, I'll be back shortly. Um, let's begin. This uh, topic of resilient pastures is a really um, uh, interesting and important one, and uh, one that I've been uh, excited to learn about and to share information with other folks. Uh, I come from the East Coast in a uh, place that we get 36 to 40 inches of rain a year, really nicely distributed, about uh, two or three inches a month throughout the season. and. Um, and the rain generally comes and have been out here in Southern Oregon for about six years now and um, have been uh, challenged and stimulated by the uh, Mediterranean climate that is the normal here in uh, uh, Southwest Oregon, by the uh, extreme drought that we've seen through several of the past few years, wildfire, extreme heat, uh, and otherwise. Um, and so this is an important topic. Um, I will foc I focus this presentation on sort of the resilient management of pastures in droughts and um, will not cover like every tidbit of pasture management generally. I'm happy to answer questions um, on sort of like more broad pasture management uh, through the chat box or during Q&A at a couple points uh, for this presentation. Um, but I guess I will say like, I don't promise to cover everything because everything is a lot. Um, but to begin, why don't we uh, do a little, let me figure out who is in the room. And I will do that by prompting us to do a fun little interactive survey. You should see now a blue screen in front of you and this like funny little grid kind of thing in the upper left hand corner. That's called a, a QR code. And what you'll do is you'll get your smartphone out and hold your smartphone camera up to that QR code. And when you do that, your camera will prompt you to uh, follow a little link that'll take you to a website called Slido. Please do that. And when you're there, it may ask you for your name. You can ignore that. 
But once you're in there and have arrived at the Slido website, it'll prompt you with the same question. And that is, what county, uh, in what county are you located? I'm just curious about where folks are. Um, I know I'm here in Jackson County with uh, Rachel and Pete. And we heard from, I was talking to my buddy Scott, who's up in, um, up in Crook County and just curious about where folks are located. And so you can just type in the name of your county there and we'll get a sense of who is on the Zoom meeting. Let's see, and I can tell that we have 47 people uh, in this Zoom meeting, and I can tell that 21 of those folks have responded. And I can appreciate that you may be eating your dinner, or since it's the end of your day, you're charging your phone rather than uh, keeping it run right in front of you. But I'll give us a few minutes. It would be great. We'll do a few more of these questions and would really uh, appreciate your engagement on them. So lots of folks from uh, Jackson County, uh, one or two from uh, both Deschutes and uh, Wasco. A couple of Jacksons, uh, four now dropped into the chat, I think, as an alternative. So, okay, that is, I suppose, an alternative. A little <laughs> bit less fun than this interactive blue screen we have, but uh, so it goes. Also, if you were on your computer and chose not to use a smartphone, you could go to slido.com and enter in uh, 2280665, and that would bring you to the same thing if you were a uh, not smartphone user. Okay, lots of folks from Jackson County. Um, sort of surprised that we don't have anyone from Josephine County. It's just down the way. Um, and a few uh, folks from elsewhere, Klamath, Deschutes, and Wasco. Um, and I guess I would say reasonable uh, in terms of the audience for the Lamb Steward program, as well as what I'm going to talk about will mostly be a Southwest Oregon kind of thing. Many of these principles will apply uh, more broadly. Uh, some will be sort of site specific. On to the next question. What species of livestock do you raise? Goats, camels, cows, horses? Uh-oh, what's happening? I think that will prompt you on your phone. Uh-oh, something's out of control. It looks like people have found this one. Horses, uh, beef, cattle, hat, chickens, rabbits, camelids. I'm gonna a couple of minutes to do that. Alpacas, goats, and chickens, squirrels. I'll read the chat in case you can't uh, multitask. I know you can, but dairy goats and star thistle. I can't do the phone and computers at the same time, but no animals except for a cat. No critters right now, but I'm a land broker. Deer, beef, deer. That's a good answer. <laughs> okay. Horses and grazing pigs to add to the mix. Cool. Pomeranians, leasing to cattle, uh, chickens, somebody who... Uh, Works at the plant clinic, Wagyu cattle and horses. None at the moment. Chickens leading the way. What a deal. Cool. Um, we'll just give us give another minute to see if anybody else has um, has comments on this. I'm gonna have to refocus my presentation onto poultry. I was not <laughs> entirely, entirely my plan, but certainly doable. <laughs> certainly doable. You're good on the fly. Oh yeah. Um, Okay, I think that's it on that one. We're gonna do one more question, two more questions now, um, where it looks like there's one person typing. How many acres do you manage? Uh, less than five, five to 20, 20 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 250, and 250 to 500. There we go, people are figuring that out. You can see them bar zooming along there in real time. I found an extension bulletin uh, from like 1940 on uh, managing uh, pastures for like poultry. And I think I should go pull that out of my out of my uh, closet if I can rifle through my papers there. Kind of interesting. We don't have anything today from OSU Extension on pastures for poultry, but certainly a relevant, uh, a reasonable topic. 
So we got lots of small acreage, um, small acreage folks, uh, a few in the larger, but no, none of the large sized farms. And I think last I looked, the average uh, farm size in Jackson County is about like 90 acres. And so leaning in a smaller direction makes, makes good sense. All right, we've heard from 27 people. And then one more question for you. Do you have water rights for irrigation? You're all getting good at this. Excellent. Someone in the chat says, yes, but it's TID. That just only sort of counts, I guess. <laughs> all right. So looks like um, looks like about two thirds of folks have some irrigation rights. Some folks are dry land and other folks do not know. Um, very good. All right. Back to presentation land here for a moment, at least. Um, <laughs> um, there is a, uh, a French uh, nutritionist named Andre Voisin, who is sometimes thought of as the father of rotational grazing and uh, wrote a book called Grass Productivity back in like the 50s or 60s. And uh, in modern times, lots of folks have turned to, to Andre for a sort of inspiration in, um, in grazing management. And one of the quotations that, uh, that I think I like of his um, is, we must help the grass to grow and guide the cow in harvesting it. And it's possible that if you've heard me talk to the land stewards about pasture management, you've heard me say this. So I do think that those are two important pieces of uh, pasture management when we're thinking about really optimizing those systems. It is both the helping the grass to grow and then guiding the cow or the horse or the goat or the chicken in harvesting that uh, grass. And those are sort of two pieces of a puzzle. Um, however, when we are operating in catastrophic drought, um, I, and as I was thinking about this this morning, I thought, you know, if I say some other words, I can just quote myself. And that's what I did. And I say, in bad drought, we must try to keep the grass alive and the cow as well, hopefully. Because um, sometimes the circumstances are different and it can really be a uh, operating on the margin in terms of the nature of our uh, farms or, or hobbies, the expenses that we might have when things are not uh, normal and are challenging. And we certainly have seen that to some extent in recent years. This time last year in 2022, uh, we can look at the drought monitor, which I think is a valuable resource, um, and see that much of Oregon is in a severe, uh, extreme, or exceptional drought, including Jackson County, uh, being in severe and exceptional this time last year, and uh, much of central Oregon uh, being in exceptional drought. Uh, uh, winter precipitation this year, to some degree, has ameliorated this drought, um, though not entirely through Oregon. We, here's the most recent release from a few days ago of the drought monitor for this year, and we still have a patch of uh, extreme and exceptional drought in central Oregon, though we've shifted down to moderate drought and um, uh, severe drought in Jackson County. And this kind of measure weaves together the uh, snowpack in the mountains, the precipitation that has fallen compared to normal, the fill of our reservoirs and the moisture of the soils. Um, and those things are integrated together as uh, in terms of this drought monitor. But it's something that we keep track of here to try to understand a sort of big picture of the state of water across the West in, in Oregon and in Southwest Oregon in particular. And regardless of the status of the drought, here in the Rogue Valley, we have a sort of like dynamic water situation throughout the year. We live in a Mediterranean climate, and that means that it rains in the winter and it does not rain very much in the summer. Um, here's Central Point. I don't know if these are good data. I got them off of Wikipedia like 15 minutes ago. Um, but it's close enough for what we're talking about here. It is kind of wet where we get a couple of inches of rain in uh, 
November, December, January, February, March, April, and May. And then in June, July, August, and September, it really can be quite dry with less than an inch of rainfall. And um, that sort of dynamic nature of rainfall we'll talk about in a minute can really um, plays an important role in how much pasture we can grow and the way that we can feed our animals on that pasture. Um, we can sort of translate this kind of, um, well, actually, Rachel, you said you were interested in the climate change projections. Do you, our folks on here want to see the climate change projections for Southwest Oregon? Well, this is probably the past 20 years of average rainfall. Um, we could go show you a little tool online if you're curious. Someone says yes, everyone else is silent. Game on, okay. Go it. We'll do it live here. Um, uh, not this thing, new tab, new tab. How do you even do that? All right, there's a, a tool called the Climate Toolbox. Let's check that out. You can do this at home as well if you want. Climate Toolbox. And we'll leave it to Dr. Google to get us the first, um, first choice here, which is climatetoolbox.org. Um, I think if we scroll down, we get some like indicators of reputability here, uh, federal government and their Northwest Climate Hub. Uh, we could probably click on these things. Um, University of California Merced is a legitimate institution. And so we should have a moderate amount of confidence, at least in the nature of presentation of data here. Um, but you can see there are lots of tools, um, but we, let's check out the Climate Mapper. Ah, this will work best using Google. Oh, that's not even, just ignore that. That's probably not important. Um, and so here is a map um, that it's showing us of some climate data. We've got to play around with these uh, little screens on the left-hand side. Let me make those a little bit larger so you can see them. Um, what do we want? We want to have some forecasts for the future or projections through uh, the year uh, 2100. You can click on that. Um, the area, we'll let it be sort of continuous. We have choices of the variables we can look at. And so what, the, what they're doing here is taking, well, let me explain that a little more clearly. They're taking a, a number of different climate models that are put together by different governments around the world. Um, and they're averaging those together and then sort of like downscaling them locally. Um, we should say this is a really good estimate of what might happen in the future. I trust that the if these folks uh, were perfect at predicting the future, they probably would be like doing other jobs on the stock market or something rather than building climate models if they just had it perfect. And so they're making a good estimate here of what might happen. Um, I'm interested in rainfall because we're talking about drought. I am interested in annual rainfall rather than the seasonal one. And let's see here. We are, we've got both, um, I want to see the, um, the future change, the relative difference in rainfall from sort of like normal from 1971 through 2000. And we'll jump forward and see like a relative difference. And just to have some extremity about it, we will go to what is called the um, relative concentration pathway RCP 8.5. And this is like the worst case scenario. Uh, the like world does not get our act together. We continue to like increase, uh, increasingly pump out carbon dioxide. And I think last I read about this R RCP 8.5, um, it is really unlikely to happen given some of like the changes in adoption of clean energy. Um, it is unlikely to be this bad, but this is like the worst case scenario, and we're going to predict out to 2070 to 20, uh, 2019, uh, 2099. Um, so I'll click on that. And here is what we see in the United States. Here's the little chart. Let me zoom out on this thing a little bit more. Um, we can't quite see the top of that chart, but it's looking like here in the Pacific Northwest, or sort of in these greenish, tealish shades. And so that means a little bit wetter. Um, and I guess if I like generally think about uh, climate change and its impacts, we expect the world to be a little bit warmer uh, and we expect the world to be a little bit more variable in terms of uh, weather. And maybe a rule of thumb is that wetter places get wetter and drier places get drier. Um, but as we talked about in that um, chart of Central Point's uh, weather, or excuse me, precipitation distribution, 
we don't the like annual distribution is uh, or the annual precipitation is sort of interesting, but I guess I would say maybe the seasonal precipitation is even more interesting. So let's look at winter rainfall here in Oregon. And so instead of the annual rainfall, we will go to December, January, and February. Again, we're looking forward to uh, 2070 through 2099. And that's like wetter still. We're a darker color of teal where our winters will get wetter. And then let's compare that to the summer of uh, June, July, and August. And that is getting a little bit drier. And so what it looks to me like from these predictions is that here in Oregon, we will have a wetter wet season and a drier dry season based on these um, estimates. And that may exacerbate some of the summer dry challenges that we see today in pasture management and agriculture. We'll be a little bit further reliant on capturing that winter rain in reservoirs or in healthy soil and being able to meter out that moisture through the year. So there's a climate prediction. You can go noodle around in the climate toolbox further. We could spend all evening doing this, but that's not really the intention. Um, all right, back to PowerPoint land. Um, we see this seasonal rainfall. And the one thing that we should remember about forage plants, the grasses and the legumes, your lawn, an alfalfa field, um, is that the response to uh, more water in terms of forage growth is pretty linear. And what do I mean by that? Um, here's an experiment that I did um, at the research station a couple of years ago. Over the course of one season, I like set up some fancy sprinkler arrangement and when we, when the sprinklers applied no water to this uh, perennial pasture mix, it was different forage species. I grew about a thousand pounds of forage. When we applied eight inches of water, we grew about a ton of forage, uh, 16 inches of water, maybe a ton and a half, and uh, 25 inches of water, mm, four and a half tons. And so not exactly linear, but as you add more water, you grow more forage during our summer dry season. Um, and that is really is like a good rule of thumb across different forage species. This is pretty well true. For some other crops, um, there can be opportunities to apply a little bit of water stress at certain times of the year. Uh, for example, if you were a pear orchardist here in the valley, um, you probably would not want any drought. It is desirable to keep those pears well watered. Uh, but if there was going to be a water shortage, you probably could short those pear trees water in uh, early in the year when they are um, mostly growing vegetation. But towards the end of the season, as those pears are ripening, that is really an opportunity to put size on those pears. And you'd really want to make sure they had adequate water at that point. And there are examples with many other garden crops and uh, other things that we grow where there'll be a time when you can reduce the water uh, applied to some degree and still maintain pretty high yields. With forages, it just is a linear thing. The more water you apply up to a point, um, the more yield that you'll find. And we found that here um, at the research station here a couple of years ago. And this was actually like a more complicated experiment than I'm showing you. I had uh, a six species mixture of forages um, that were being grown under these different irrigation treatments. And I went through and like spent my weekends listening to audiobooks and sorting the different forage species that were planted there. And so I had uh, two grasses, orchard grass and tall fescue, three legumes, birds for trefoil, red clover and white clover and plantain planted out there. And sort of interesting that like when you don't water these at all, more than half of what was grown there were just weeds. And when it's well watered, we see a really big proportion of the planted forages. And this yellow color, that's red clover, really does great when it's well watered, at least in this, uh, in this circumstance. But we'll set that aside. Um, and we know that um, not everywhere has irrigation and that our environment is Mediterranean and could be dry and crunchy and brown in the summer. Um, historically would have been a uh, sort of mosaic of perennial grasses and broadleaf plants, uh, forbs. And in 1830, 1850, folks started to inhabit the West Coast and brought with them a set of challenging weeds. Um, I think these are familiar to folks and probably are present in some of your pastures. 
foxtail, medusa head, yellow star thistle? These are common questions. And I trust that shortly after I mention this and then move right on, someone's going to drop in a chat box. How do we kill these things? We can loop back to that in a, in a, in a moment. But these are annual species rather than perennials. They start their life cycles with uh, rainfall uh, in October or November. They grow through the winter. Come the spring, April, May, June, they will set their seeds. Those seeds will fall to the ground. And then they really won't try to grow at all during that dry period of the summer. And that's how they are adapted to the Mediterranean environment um, is by just growing during the wet season and really not trying to grow at all during the dry season. And that's a reasonable strategy. They are successful in uh, this part of the world. They are good at being weeds because of that strategy. Uh, however, that brings challenges for livestock management, be it a like chicken or camel or cow. Um, if we have some uh, moisture um, in an irrigated environment, we'll start with here. Let's look at how pastures grow throughout the year. Um, on the, this is a little, we'll look at a bunch of these little charts like this. On this like vertical axis over here, we got to think about a pasture growth rate. And I think it's the first time someone said pasture growth rate to me, it didn't really make any sense. But what, I, what we know is that pastures during like the warm season, they were growing every day. So is your lawn. You might like mow your lawn once a week. And that means it's like grown a little bit for the past seven days. And pasture growth rate, I want to think about how many pounds of pasture per acre uh, you might grow during the year. Right now, our grass is not growing very much. Um, and it always like sort of shocks me as we talk about management uh, at the research station. Uh, farm manager feels like relatively quiet. Things are under control in March. And then come the end of March, beginning of April, things warm up and the grasses really start growing. And we go from being like just twiddling our thumbs a little bit to like, oh, yikes, we need to hire six more staff members to mow the lawns, to weed whack the fence lines, to get this under control. Because as it warms up, the day length, uh, uh, the day length lengthens. And those two things together spur on the growth of grasses. And so we see a real acceleration in the, the growth of grass in April and May. And at this point, if we were to like put some measurements on this stylized chart, you might be growing 100 pounds of gr dry grass per acre per day. And that's quite a bit. Um, come the summer, and even in a well-irrigated environment, in our summers, when we have temperatures in the 90s, 100, apparently sometimes like 115 uh, in the summer, that is too hot for the grasses to really grow their best. And so even if they're well watered, we'll see a bit of a slump, a slowing down of production of those grasses because they're heat stressed. There are like some physiological reasons why that occurs. We can talk about that if we need to, not totally important, but that we have a big hump of growth in the spring. And even when well watered, we see a little bit of trough of production in the summer. And then come the fall, as things cool off uh, a bit, we'll see a little bit more of a hump of growth and at some point, it gets cool enough, and those day, length and day lengths shorten enough that uh, growth slows down. So we call this a bimodal, two modes, one mode here, one mode there, bimodal growth curve uh, for these uh, pasture, common pasture species. And so then we say, here's how much grass is growing every day. Um, what we also know is that if we have animals grazing on that grass, they will probably also be doing that just about every day. They can be out there. Uh, grazing animals on pasture is generally like the least expensive way of managing livestock rather than purchasing feed or carrying hay or leaving those animals in the barn. If we can have them out on pasture. Uh, that would be a really good cost-effective way of feeding those animals. Um, animals, depending on what they are, eat like different amounts of forages. I'm going to use a cow as an example and leave cats aside for though several of you are managing cats as your livestock species. Um, what we know is that a dry cow is gonna eat sort of a set amount every day. If it's a mature mama cow, there'll be a little bit of fluctuation around her uh, gestation and uh, uh, lactation cycles, maintaining that uh, calf. But generally we can say, a cow will eat about the same amount every day. Our like rule of thumb in uh, animal science is that a, uh, most ruminants will eat about 3% of their body weight in dry grass every day. 
um, a thousand pound cow is going to eat about 30 pounds of grass. Um, I'm suggesting that this peak might be near 100. And so if I have uh, one acre, a one acre little zone there, um, some days I'm growing less grass than that cow is eating. In the middle of the spring, there's way more grass than that cow is eating. But sort of have this maintenance requirement for a cow um, is out there every day. Um, and this is if we're like well stocked and well managed. We'll talk about when things go awry here in a moment. And what does that mean? If this is like the demand by the cow and this double humped line is the supply by the pasture, um, it means that there is this sort of like green excess of forage in the fall and the spring. We get like close to matching supply and demand in the summer, um, but there's an excess of forage in the, in the spring. And it's not uncommon for folks who are managing irrigation, irrigated pastures to take a cutting of hay off of that pasture in the spring. And that's a way of like chopping off this excess that really would be go, go, potentially going to waste because it's uh, not being utilized by the cow. Um, but it's quite common that in the winter, when the grass growth is slow, it's also like kind of muddy out in the world, can be cold depending on where you are. Um, we see that pasture growth drops below the requirement of that cow. And that's a time when we need, there's a deficit and we need to do something to fill that deficit, feeding hay. Perhaps it's hay that you cut off this spring hump of growth and you can feed it out in the, um, uh, in the winter. And so we'd say this is like a reasonably good, good scenario. We have an excess of forage. We can cut some of this for hay. We just move that extra feed that we've grown into this time of deficit. And that works pretty well. Sometimes you say like, well, I would like to have another horse or somebody donates you another horse or uh, the prices for, for cattle were good last year. And so you bought a few more calves. And what, what does that mean in this situation? We can add more animals to this pasture and increase the demand on the pasture. So I've taken this animal demand dotted line and we'll move it on up. And I think that you can uh, suss out wh what will happen in this circumstance where we go from an excess of pasture to now we're utilizing more of this pasture. But when we do that, we've got many more days when the pasture is not meeting the demand of those animals. The animals need to eat every day at a pretty consistent rate, but the pasture grows fast in the spring, slow in the winter, slow in the summer. And now we've got a lot of days when we're going to need to feed that animal, bring feed, add it into the system, purchased pellets from the store, hay that you cut from last year, you purchased from Klamath Falls or down in California. And we're starting to approach a situation where we say, oh, we've got a lot of days when we need to feed this, feed these animals out there because we've not very well balanced the supply and the demand. Um, becomes a more expensive proposition to try to pull that off. And so if we like zo zoom back to this, I make a statement about uh, irrigated pasture uh, can meet the feed needs of livestock through most of the growing season. We should make sure this is ruminant livestock, probably won't meet the feed needs of your cat and chicken just because they need things other than our forage plants to eat uh, through most of the year in Southern Oregon, but dry land pastures cannot. A challenge with dryland pastures, they're sort of like those weeds that we were talking about. They'll start to grow when rains come in October and will hustle along and they'll grow a lot. I'm looking at this dotted line here in the spring, but then they don't make any attempt to grow during the dry summer. They're going to drop seeds and turn into sort of a mulchy mat on the ground. And that, that if we think about the demand from our livestock, means that we can have another circumstance where much of the year there is a deficiency of feed out there. We can't expect that our pastures, dry land pastures, will feed an animal every day. We'll feed an animal for six weeks or two months if we're lucky on a dry land pasture. And for the rest of the year, we're really going to need to feed that animal some feed in order to meet their nutritional requirements. There are some folks who are able to operate economically viable livestock operations without using irrigation in the, in the region. But I think you'll find as you explore those systems, those folks are using elevation to their advantage where they have some uh, dry pasture low in the valley that can be utilized during the fall and winter and early spring. 
But then in the summer are moving animals onto uh, public allotments on forest service land up in the Cascades or the Siskiyous and use, utilizing uh, that cooler, more moderate environment at high elevation to feed those animals. And, are, um, and so are accessing sort of different environments in order to fill what would be a feed deficit if they kept the animals in one environment through the entire year. And so they're definitely, uh, you definitely can uh, as a small, uh, a small holding landowner uh, maintain livestock on dry uh, without irrigation. We should expect that you're going to pay a significant amount in terms of keeping that animal fed through the summer and the winter, and that there'll be good grazing just for a, a couple of months there in the spring. And so if the grass is not growing, what are the options? Because um, I've sort of talked about ideal circumstances, the ideal uh, irrigated pasture and the ideal uh, dry land environment, but we know in some cases like there just is not water available for your irrigated pasture or even in your dry pasture situation. Something about the environment um, it, well, it's easy for me to like generalize an average, but no year is actually average. What are we going to do when the grass is not growing? I guess I could have asked you to shout that out, but instead I'll just tell you some answers. Um, and we mentioned this, we could feed stored or purchased feed, um, definitely an option um, to do that, but it can be expensive. Um, if you've stored feed, um, maybe you store that feed with the intention to feed it in the fall, but in a droughty summer, instead of being able to feed it in the fall or the winter, you have to feed it in the summer. And again, animals have to like eat every day. This cow wants to eat 30 pounds of grass uh, every day in, in order to just maintain her condition, not even to uh, put, on it, put on any weight. Um, and so it's definitely an option. And it gets expensive. And I think folks realize that that can be the case. Um, for our perennial grasses, those perennial grasses stay alive because they have a little reserve of energy in the stubble, like right at the crown, at the root, at the uh, just above the ground level. There is a little, some leaves left and a reserve of energy. Uh, in some cases, folks will say like, well, Gordon, that stubble, a cow can actually eat it. She'll have to do some work in order to, uh, to get enough bites in because they're going to be pretty small bites, but we can graze the stubble. And that's some feed that I don't have to purchase. That's free for me. And you may do that. Um, cows will probably be hungry because they're going to have to work hard to do that. And um, for those perennial grasses, they really need that, uh, that little zone that's just two or three inches above the ground in order to um, maintain their pereni perennial status and stay alive. And so if you just say, we're going to keep on grazing, uh, we'll find that we're going to kill out some of those desirable perennials that are in your pasture. Um, sometimes um, we would just say like, well, Gordon, you like fattened yourself up over winter by eating so many like corn chips. Now it's the summer and food is scarce. Uh, like fat is on our body as an energy reserve. We can, maybe it is time to burn through some fat. And that, that can be a possibility depending on the condition of livestock to allow their fat reserves to, to be a little bit of a buffer in terms of feed supply. Uh, needs to be done pretty carefully in terms of uh, the breeding cycles and reproduction for, uh, for animals that in some cases when cows are in uh, too poor of condition, and when I say too poor of condition, I mean like too skinny, um, they, will not, uh, they will not breed back. And if we're in a breeding operation, that can be a challenge, but there often is a little bit of buffer in terms of the condition that, live, that uh, livestock have, um, and we can manipulate their weight in times of excess feed and deficiency in that way. There's some potential of moving to greener pastures. Um, perhaps uh, those folks who are managing their dry land cattle operations are going to load up those cattle on a, on a truck and trailer them up into the mountains. Um, I heard a story about, oh, and I won't remember, the La Jornada Experimental Range. This is a USDA um, uh, experimental sort of research site that is rangeland in um, New Mexico, in Southern New Mexico, and is a pretty like close to desert kind of environment. And I won't get like any of these details right, but um, like sometime in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a very bad drought and there were pretty large herds of, of cattle. And as we like think about this supply and demand kind of chart, um, if we don't do something 
and the, the drought means that the grass doesn't grow, um, but the cows still need to eat every day, they will like find something to eat. And as a result of that, of a couple years of bad drought, all of the, or the vast majority of the desirable native perennial plants in that uh, part of the world were grazed to the ground. Uh, they were grazed to the ground, then invasive annual plants were able to repopulate over time. And even after like a century of experimental research on that uh, La Jornada range, they have never recovered it. The only parcel in that part of the world that still, uh, that, that made it through that drought was like the one like rich fella who could put his cattle on a train and take them by rail to Montana to entirely escape the drought, to move his cattle to greener pastures and protect the perennials he had. Because if you didn't, they grazed the stubble into the ground, killed the perennials and saw a real fundamental shift in that system. So sometimes like moving animals away is the right thing to do. And, um, I don't think most of us have access to train cars to put our cattle on. And so moving uh, animals away can also mean selling or slaughtering animals. And this is all about tactics to match the supply and the demand. Um, and supply and the demand like sort of in the moment. There are other, some other strategies we can consider to improve the resilience. But in some cases we say like, yikes, it is June or July and I'm looking out in front of me and the grass is not growing. We have to do something to make changes. And these are some options. So let's see, Rachel, do we have any questions in the chat box at this juncture? Or if there are any questions, now would be a time that I, I could pause and take a question on this just supply and demand kind of question, the weather and the climate, and we'll dig into some more details. Nothing in the chat. And if you want to prompt folks to unmute and ask or drop them in the chat, either way, I can read them or Gordon yeah. can read them. He's, he's a good reader. <laughs> I'm reading for perennial grasses that are drought tolerant. Yes, let's talk about them in a minute. I'm going to... Um, uh, and the question about when to replant, we can talk about that as well. Um, and so just on this sort of supply and demand question and the strategies uh, mid-season, if some questions pop up, we'll take some of those. Um, but I'm acknowledging questions. Um, Gordon? Yes. Can we overcome some of this with stocking rates? You can overcome some of this with stocking rates. Let me go back to stocking rate land. Um, this choice for me is stocking rate. I can do one cow per acre and there'll be excess grass and that is can be fine. I can do two cows or two horses per acre and that can be fine but I'm going to have more deficiency when I put more animals on the land and I'm going to have a, a, a less deficiency in forage when there are fewer animals on the land. You absolutely have a choice. And perhaps in a really good, nice wet year, um, we this would work fine that you'd grow more grass than normal. Maybe you'd do a little fertilizer, um, you'd manage your grazing carefully, and that could work fine. And if you were a, a business person of it, you might make good money where in this case you're saying, there's some argument to be made that the grass is being wasted during some of this season, um, during being wasted during some of the season. <clears throat> um, but that's in a good season that that grass would be wasted. It is offering you a buffer in a season where things don't go quite, quite right and you've got a little bit more of a reserve of forage, standing forage to rely on. And so like, yes, that the stocking rate is a piece of this puzzle. I think I would say that one, um, maybe horse pastures, not to call those out, but I've like driven around and seen enough of them are probably overstocked. It takes almost two acres to maintain uh, a horse in this part of the world. And when you have three or four horses on a half, half an acre, we've like blown beyond this, that um, you've got a, a line that's up here. There really is never any excess forage and you're operating in a sort of like dirt and mud environment. And we really aren't feeding those horses from pasture. We, it could just as well that those horses be on a gravel or a uh, dirt lot and we're just feeding them hay. The pasture isn't, isn't really part of, their, um, part of their diet. It is just the place where they're hanging out. Um, 
And uh, Tate has a question about uh, how about moving cows from dry land pastures after May uh, to TID irrigated pastures after that? And I'm like, yeah, that is definitely an option if we go to like this thing that you'll grow a bunch of uh, forage on dry land pasture during the spring in a very similar way that you would on an irrigated pasture. That's just all like winter rainfall that's being stored in the soil or is actively falling, uh, being used to grow those plants. Um, but right, when we get to end of May, June, beginning of July, that dry land pasture will be getting awful dry and crunchy and um, moving animals onto irrigated pasture. Um, that, that would be a reasonable way to use those two resources together. Um, if you don't graze your, uh, your irrigated pasture until July, when the dry land pasture runs out, you will find that there is a lot of grass out there and probably more grass than those cows can eat. Um, in some cases, it is graze the dry land pasture in the late winter, when your irrigated pasture has grown a good crop, have someone come in and take a cutting of hay off of that, continue grazing your dry land pasture until that irrigated pasture that was just hayed regrows to six or eight or 10 inches, and then switch on to that um, relatively new regrowth on that irrigated pasture as a way of capturing this excess growth that'll occur on the irrigated pasture while you're utilizing the dry land. And then a question about uh, when to pull the uh, animals off entirely. Let's get to that when we talk about grazing management in just a minute. We've seen all of that. Okay, some further considerations. Let's talk about soils, forage species, and grazing management. I know we had a question there about forage species and about grazing management, but let's talk about soil a little bit. Um, Yikes. Prior to doing that, we're going back to our fun little app game here. We're going to get back to that thing. Um, here it is. Next question. I want to know about soil testing. Have you all taken a soil test of your pasture's fertility or even your property if you're just raising chickens and um, uh, chickens and cats? Um, Never have. I have at some point. I don't know. I have in the past three years. 15 respondents. If you didn't want to play with us early and you want to earlier and you want to play with us now, it's a good time to get out your smartphones, swipe open the camera app, hold it up to that little QR code in the corner and um, uh, scan that. You'll be prompted to this Slido website and you can just click in your answer. Looks like we've had 22 folks respond. Let's give us another five or six seconds if anyone else wants to uh, enter their answer there. Twenty-five folks. That's a pretty good response rate. Unfortunately, most of you got the wrong answer, and the answer was no. Yikes! Didn't we talk about soil testing in the land stewards? We really ought to be testing our soil to understand its capacity to grow plants, particularly if it's an important part um, of our land management system, where we're trying to feed our chickens or goats or camels or or cows or horses. Um, the pasture can be a really excellent way of, of providing that feed, but we have to. As Andre Vuzan said, we have to help the grass grow and guide the cow in harvesting it. We can't just like leave the grass on its own to say like, good luck, grow if you want to. Um, we gotta provide some support to that. And part of that is taking care of the soil and understanding the nutrient status of the soil in order to do, to do that. Uh, Alyssa says, not yet, but we'll do it this spring. Excellent, good, good option. All right, soils. How do how will Alyssa take a good soil test this spring? And the other like 61% of you who've not done so, get ready. We're going to zoom through this thing. First thing you're going to do is Google a guide to collecting soil samples for farms and gardens. And you can like type OSU in there and you'll find a little extension bulletin number uh, EC628. This is a pretty straightforward process. We're going like to go out and look at the property and think about it in zones where uh, here in this figure one, we're going to subdivide the pasture away from maybe like a vineyard up here in zone C, separate from a vegetable garden or a zone A in the, um, the orchard there. 
I'm going to subdivide into management units. I sort of expect the soil requirements for an orchard are different than for my pasture or for my lawn. Uh, then we're going to go out there. Thank you, Rachel, for putting that link right there in the chat box. We're going to go out there and we're going to take some sort of like random subsamples within each of these units. We're going to go to 15 or 20 places. I don't really expect that the soil is exactly the same right here as it is right there. And I want to average out that variation through my sampling. You can use a shovel or a trowel to take these samples, but like a one key piece to keep in mind is that we want an even proportion of soil that's at the soil surface with soil that is about six inches deep. If when I am being sort of, when I'm digging a hole with a shovel, I will like shovel in this way and then I'll shovel in this way and I will lift a wedge of soil out of the ground. And when I do that, I have a lot of soil from the soil surface and only a little bit of soil from the six inch depth. And that is going to bias my sample and probably show an except a um, is going to bias it sort of high. Well, it'll look like there are more nutrients there than there actually are. If you're using a shovel, you're going to dig that little wedge shaped slice and then you're going to come back with your shovel and you're going to take another slice, if I can do this with my hands, along the edge of that uh, wedge that you took out. And so now you have this sort of like diagonal one inch thick wedge of soil that has an even proportion of top inch of soil, even proportion of soil at the six inch depth. Um, that is definitely a possibility. It sounds like a hassle to me. Come over here to the extension office or to your local and friendly extension office, and they will provide you with a soil, soil corer. We will like make you sign away your life in order to borrow that, but you'll borrow it for free and we'll only, like the law will only come crashing down if you don't return the soil corer to us. We'd be happy to lend it out to you. Um, you're gonna be consistent in looking at that soil core or your shovel about getting six inches deep um, with those uh, soil samples. Uh, Alyssa's idea of doing it in the spring is a good idea. If you charge into this exercise in the summer, you will find that dry soil is quite hard and it can be difficult to get down to six inches. You're gonna take those 15 to 26 inch cores, knock them into a bucket, blend them around a little bit. If you like find a large rock in there or an arrowhead, like a large worm or a gopher, you could take those things out because the soil testing lab doesn't need them. They just need the soil. Though don't worry about like little pebbles and little roots. They'll sieve the soil before they analyze it. And you're gonna take about two cups of that soil, uh, do some Google searching or call me and find yourself an appropriate and reputable soil testing lab. I believe there's some sketchy dude who used to like take do soil analysis in his basement in Grants Pass. I would not recommend using uh, that soil testing service. We want a professional full-time soil testing service. This does not need to be local to the Rogue Valley, though we do want one that serves the Western United States. We'll go to their website. They'll have a form, you know, like I want the basic soil test. It's going to cost 20, 30, maybe $40, but like really not a huge expense. Um, if you're this uh, landowner up here, you're going to send them three bags, one that's labeled B for pasture, one that's labeled C for vineyard, and one that's labeled A for uh, orchard, 15 sample, 15 to 20 cores in each of those bags. And um, there's, we just need sort of the basic tests some things that we might ask, and I can give Rachel this, uh, this uh, slide if you want. There are lots of different like sort of like juicy solutions we can shake over soil and then measure that solution for what the concentration of nutrients are in different parts of the world. They use sort of different chemicals to do that. We want something called Bray phosphorus or weak Bray 1 phosphorus for our soils here on the west of the Cascades. If you were in Scott's part of central Oregon, um, they would use a different phosphorus extractant where those pHs are more neutral, and that's called an Olsen phosphorus um, or sodium bicarbonate phosphorus. Sort of complicated. We want to break phosphorus for this part of the world, and we also want ammonium acetate extracted potassium. Um, if you say, I'm in western Oregon, are you a lab that uses OSU's uh, recommended uh, soil testing methods? They will do the right thing. There's a lab up on campus. You can use them. They're kind of slow and kind of expensive compared to the commercial labs, but uh, sending them up there will make sure you have uh, get good results. Uh, take notes that you can also borrow a soil core from our Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District located on Alder Street in Central Point. Um, uh, Rachel puts in here the uh, 
guide of extension of analytical labs serving Oregon. That is a list of analytical labs which serve Oregon. That is not a guarantee that it is a reputable lab. There are some bad labs on that list. Like goodness knows why that exists, but it is the case. And so we um, want to make sure that that lab is running a bray phosphorus and an ammonium acetate uh, potassium at the very least um, in order to make sure it is adequate. And I can help you noodle around and hone in on what the tricks are to find a good soil testing lab. Um, let's look at a soil test report. I was just talking with a hemp grower, and this is his soil test report from this morning, but is... Um, and this is from a laboratory. I'm not necessarily recommending AL Western Lab. I've used them in the past, but I also use lots of other labs. Um, and soil test report is like a, an excellent thing because it's really pretty complicated. And they give us a lot of numbers. It sort of can be colored sometimes. Other times it's not colored. And you say blue, green, red. Does that mean like good, bad, good, worse? Um, should we be worried about having an excess of soil organic matter, an excess of uh, magnesium or copper or iron? No, probably not. We don't need to fertilize your pasture either with boron nor with sodium. But the two things that we look at on a soil test for a, a resilient pasture are phosphorus and potassium, P and K. Uh oh. Um, I mentioned just a second ago that we want to use Bray phosphorus. And so here we are looking at Bray phosphorus right there. Um, when you have a soil test result that came from a reputable laboratory, that is a good time for you to give me a call. And I will help you walk through it and say, think about these parts. Don't think about those parts. Um, but for resilient pastures, we definitely want to think about phosphorus and potassium. And both of these, for this uh, hemp field that came out of uh, pasture years ago and is in Josephine County, or in this low category, but we don't really trust the labs um, categories. We want to trust OSU's categories. We're really well uh, calibrated for Oregon's conditions, while this lab serves like all of the Western United States. And so how do we translate this eight parts per million of uh, Bray phosphorus or uh, 82 parts per million of uh, potassium into like, what do we do? we go to another extension bulletin called the Soil Test Interpretation Guide. Um, and if we pop open the Soil Test Interpretation Guide to like page four here, we will see that there is a section for potassium. So we remember that that uh, it said that we had 82 parts per million of potassium. Let's zoom in on this so we can see it. And we have an extractable soil test K using the ammonium acetate method that we talked about just a minute ago. Um, 82 parts per million is down here in this lowest of low categories, and their recommendation is to then apply 100 to 300 pounds of K2O, which is like potassium oxide. It's the way that we do um, uh, nutrient elements in fertilizer land. That's confusing, but um, we would need to apply uh, 100 to 300 pounds of this uh, K2O. I don't think I would apply that all in one year, even though I've got a really low test level of just 82. I would think about applying maybe 100 or 150 uh, pounds of that uh, potassium per year uh, to get us up out of this low category. We really want to be above 150 parts per million in this medium category. When we're in medium, we're feeling okay. We're feeling pretty nervous when we're in a low category for both phosphorus and potassium, according to this OSU guide, not necessarily according to the uh, soil testing laboratory. They'll use different numbers. Um, this is like when, when we're in the low category, that is a yield limiting and production limiting uh, thing. If this is a pasture just for your cat, you may not worry about it. If this is a pasture for your herd of uh, your herd of beef cattle, I would worry about it. These are economic thresholds, not um, some like amorphous healthiness of the world thresholds. Um, but potassium in particular, when we're thinking about a resilient pasture is important. Potassium is a positively charged ion. It would like sort of like dissolve in water and would be these little uh, K plus ions floating around in a solution. And a plant uses those to help control um, 
its uh, stomata, how like open and closed its pores are, uh, bringing in carbon dioxide and letting out water vapor. We want that process to be well controlled during a drought. Um, it also helps the plants do some like sort of physical processes that like curl and avoid the sun to reduce how much water they use. I found this little uh, picture that I thought was slightly interesting. This is spring barley. On the left-hand side, they grew this spring barley. This was all like in, what do you call it? Hydroponic environment, no real soil, but demonstrates a thing nonetheless. Um, on the left-hand two pictures, this barley, uh, it was shorted uh, potassium, a really low potassium solution. The one on the left-hand side of that pair was well watered, and the one on the right-hand side was uh, experienced drought stress. And so over here, we've got both low potassium and drought stress. And I don't know, these like wooden blocks, I guess, are a scale that make us believe that these things are similar otherwise. When we're well watered with adequate potassium, we grow a big green plant. But even in a drought with adequate potassium, you can see that we've got much more uh, foliage on that barley plant and the root system is much denser. And so potassium is a particularly important nutrient when we're thinking about drought in pastures and their resilience and their capacity to um, not only produce feed, but for our perennial plants just to survive. Because even after, if growth has slowed on our perennial grasses because they're dry, that can be okay for a time. We just really don't want those perennial grasses to die. Um, and potassium helps to both keep those plants alive uh, or keep them growing as well as alive when water is short. In other sort of like nutrient world, something to consider um, is that some folks will put fertile nitrogen fertilizer on their pastures every year. Um, here's a drought stressed cornfield. Something that we worry about when we put a, a, a large amount of nitrogen out on a field that then has, uh, or a pasture that then is drought stressed is the plants will take up that nitrogen from the fertilizer and bring it into their plant tissue, but they won't have sufficient moisture to turn that nitrogen into the proteins. And that's sort of like the main place that nitrogen grow, goes into amino acids and then into the proteins that make the structure of the uh, cell membranes and cell walls of those plants. Um, and when it is a drought stressed environment like this cornfield, and we can tell this cornfield is drought stressed because the leaves are really curled up. If you're like from a distance or from 60 miles an hour, it sort of looks like a field of onions or something. Um, we should worry a little bit that this uh, corn crop was well fertilized when it was planted because um, the farmer was thinking that there was going to be plenty of uh, water for that uh, to metabolize that nitrogen into protein in the plant. Uh, but when there is not adequate water to metabolize that nitrogen, the nitrate ions can just hang out in that, uh, in that tissue. And nitrate, it turns out, at high concentrations is toxic to livestock. Um, we just had some email going around the forage world of the extension service, not caused by drought, but caused by a, a plants in Eastern Oregon being stressed by a frost and accumulating a lot of nitrogen and not being able to turn that into protein. Um, fed some hay off of uh, high nitrate hay, and I don't remember, or fed some cattle, some high nitrate hay, and I think like 30 cows died just from doing that it, like overnight. Um, can be very significant. We are cautious and test um, when we think that there may be uh, drought stressed forages that saw nitrogen earlier in their lives. All right. And then these are sort of like the nutrient side of things. We should also think about um, think about healthy soils and their capacity to help us improve drought resilience. Um, when I say healthy soils, it can like mean lots of things. I trust that you, you all have, have heard or read something about healthy soils. What I mean here are soils that are uh, rich in organic matter, and organic matter is the broken down roots and exudates of worms and microbes. Um, those, those compounds are sort of complex proteins and carbohydrates that sometimes get like interlinked together, and they've got a great capacity to hold on to water. Um, if you were to go at, uh, Google around and go visit the Natural Resources Conservation Service, they are big proponents of healthy soils. Their website would tell you that if you were to increase your soil organic matter by 1%, and it's common in this part of the world for soils to have 2, 3, 4, 5% organic matter, if you were to increase it from 3% to 4% by using healthy, um, healthy and uh, 
uh, resilient soil practices, they would tell you that that could hold 27,000 gallons of water in that 1% of soil organic matter. It's a fairly high estimate. And for some reason, the NRCS chooses not to give us a good uh, reference on that, where that comes from. I've seen other things that show that you're just maybe holding seven or 9,000 gallons of water per inch of, or per percentage of soil organic matter um, that you add to your soil. And the way that you build soil organic matter, um, um, build soil organic matter is because, um, we will, is by maintaining a, a healthy population of growing forage plants. The more green material, uh, leafy material you have out in the, on your pasture, um, one of the things about our, our plants that we don't always think about is they're photosynthesizing. And that means taking sun to make sugar. Uh, they will grow their, uh, their plant tissues that are forages that our uh, animals and livestock and pets can consume. Um, but some of that sugar that they create uh, will leak out of their roots. And that will spur on the uh, microbial populations, fungi, bacteria, actinomycetes in the soil. And those things, as they go through their life cycles of living and growing and dying, dying, uh, boost organic matter in the soil really effectively. We want to try to support a diversity of plants in our soils uh, or in our pastures, and that, that also helps to improve the organic matter and health of our soils. Thinking about not just growing one species of grass, but growing a few species of grass, some legumes and some forbs. We want to avoid compaction in our pastures that uh, we have a pretty long wet season and are pretty warm. The ground doesn't freeze. And so as animals are out, uh, either in the winter, they are smushing that soil down, squeezing the air spaces closed, limiting the capacity for water to infiltrate into that soil and for our uh, plants to root deeply. Um, <clears throat> and also wanna think about um, if we have the opportunity and a source for it, when we're meeting our soil fertility needs, getting those levels just right so our plants can grow really vigorously, if we have the opportunity to use things like manure or organic amendments, and when I say organic amendments, I don't mean like USDA organic stamp on your carton of milk. I mean organic in the organic chemistry kind of way, like derives from uh, carbon compounds. And so that could be manure or rotten hay or straw. Um, could be your compost from your compost pile if you've got a, one that's big enough to share some of that on the um, uh, share some of that from your vegetable garden onto your pasture. Those are all ways of building organic matter. And the more organic matter we can have in soils, the larger reservoir in terms of water holding capacity that, um, that will be available for your pasture plants. And so when it does get a little bit dry, there'll be a little bit of a larger reservoir to draw on and you'll have a few more days where those before those grasses and uh, legumes and forage plants get totally stressed. Let's see, there's a question in the chat box. We cannot use fertilizer because of our conservation uh, easement. Can we plant other things that will give nitrogen? Uh, so, yes, um, legumes, clover, alfalfa, bird's foot trefoil, we'll talk about a few of those later, are all pretty good at fixing nitrogen. They will take nitrogen that is inaccessible in the air because it's like, two nitrogen atoms tightly bonded together, our plants can't get it apart. And it really takes um, uh, legumes that have a, uh, a microbial bacterial um, symbiotic partner called rhizobia in the soil uh, <clears throat> and can pull nitrogen out of the air and make that available to our grasses and other plants in uh, our forage systems. So like, yes, we can get nitrogen into the soil by planting legumes, interseeding clovers and alfalfas and trefoils and vetches and things into a pasture um, and increase that um, nitrogen that way. And that's a good transition on to a few forage species. In this uh, part of the world, or uh, there are thousands and thousands of grass species in the world. There are a few that have become globally important in the sort of temperate to Mediterranean environment, and particularly in our slightly moister sites or in places where there is irrigation available. Uh, the top three species that, you, that I would want to look for in a, um, a high quality, uh, resilient pasture in Southern Oregon would be tall fescue, orchard grass, and perennial ryegrass. 
Um, Pelfescue is really pretty hardy. Um, it sometimes feels rough to your hands. I know there will be some people who are um, uh, who raise horses or other livestock and will say, uh, my horse will not eat tall fescue. Tall fescue is a, um, so we think about sort of like the preference of how much animals will eat these different grasses. Tall fescue is not always preferred. It has little, uh, very fine silica barbs on the edge of those leaves that really feel rough to your hand and would feel rough to your tongue were you to put some in your mouth. Probably feels the same way for your livestock but it has a benefit of being a really tough forage species. Orchard grass is one of my favorites. I spent six, five, year, five and a half years of graduate school study, studying orchard grass. Pretty palatable, sort of moderate in terms of its uh, resilience and persistence in a, in a pasture. It can be very high yielding. It's often preferred by the equine industry. And perennial ryegrass, Perennial ryegrass dominates in the Willamette Valley. It is uh, fast growing, really lush, very tender, very palatable uh, forage. Um, the trick is doesn't do great here in the Rogue Valley. If we were to think about the relative drought tolerance of these three species, we would say that tall fescue is the most drought tolerant we have of the desirable uh, perennial forage grasses. Tall or orchard grass is intermediate, and rye, perennial rye grass is the least drought tolerant. And so the tricky thing is that if you were to go to mm, the Grange Co-op or somewhere similar and look for a bag of either irrigated or dry land pasture mix, you would find that it contains some, in most cases, of all three of these species. Most drought tolerant, moderate, and least drought tolerant. And many folks will plant that. And under ideal conditions, um, the orchard grass and the uh, tall fescue, they'll last for a while and be pretty, uh, uh, pretty high yielding. And you can grow a good crop of hay or, or a nice pasture, sort of like regardless of the environmental circumstances, your soil fertility, the um, nature of your pasture. Um, perennial ryegrass just is a little bit too hot in our summers for it to persist. Um, the other day in preparation for this workshop, I decided it, it was the right time to go like trespass and look at a field. This is one of our neighbors here at the research station. I've been driving past this field for a while and have been for, it's, I guess it got planted just after I arrived, so maybe five years ago. And um, I'm enough of a forage nerd that I can do the like roadside forage identification and like sort of suss out what's in that field based on just how it looks from a distance. That's a 3.0 level level skill that we don't expect you to have. Um, and could tell that there was orchard grass and rye grass and tall fescue in that field. That said, these folks, even though they're um, fairly sophisticated farmers, have been experiencing the drought stress that uh, that occurs. Irrigation gets shut off early, um, are not able to put out as much water as it might be optimal, and the soils that they're growing these, um, growing this uh, hay, this is a hay field, they're growing this hay on, are, are really nice fertile soils, but they don't hold that much water. And so as I go and look out at this field, I say, like, this is sort of interesting, particularly in the foreground here, we can see that there are there are some uh, tufts of grass here. And even if, as I look out into the foreground, this thing is kind of lumpy. You say, like, what could be going on there? And you say, well, I happen to know that these tufts of grass are tall fescue. And as we just said, tall fescue is the most uh, drought tolerant of the forage grasses that are common in this part of the world. And so what I think has happened even despite their best efforts in management, there's been some drought stress in this pasture. And since they planted that three-way that three mix of orchard grass and tall fescue and perennial ryegrass, much of the orchard grass and the perennial ryegrass have died out and they're just left with these tufts of tall fescue. And it's not uncommon to see um, this kind of like lumpy nature of a pasture and does sort of beg the question on what should, should we be planting? Part of me says, I really like a, a mixture, a mixed pasture. And particularly if I feel like I've got a, a site that has pretty good access to moisture, my soils are deep, or maybe there's even some moisture that it, um, that is deep in the ground that those plants could access, I can keep the orchard grass and rye grass uh, persisting. But if I feel like I've got sort of junior water rights, or I'm like way down, uh, 
way down the irrigation ditch or don't have irrigation at all, I guess I, I, I would think about increasing the proportion of tall fescue in my, uh, in my pasture or my hay mix, because it really does, it gives you the best chance of maintaining those perennials and in that pasture, that if we're gonna to go to the trouble of planting a pasture, we really want those things to persist. And uh, along that continuum of the grasses that we have, tall fescue is really a good choice for that. That said, um, we're talking about healthy pastures before. We don't necessarily wanna, uh, or what it takes to uh, grow healthy soils earlier. We don't necessarily uh, want to grow that uh, tall fescue alone. Um, legumes are good for nitrogen fixation and other plant species just improve the uh, soil microbial communities that can help us out in terms of just having a resilient environment. Um, three species to consider um, are forage chicory, forage plantain, and bird's foot trefoil. All three of these are really pretty good drought tolerant species. Both chicory and plantain are really deeply rooted. These are broadleaf plants that I would classify as uh, forages, excuse me, well, I classify as forbs. Um, it's getting late in the evening for me. Um, and bird's foot trefoil is a really excellent example of a, um, of a legume where bird's foot trefoil does really well in a droughty environment. I often will walk out into a dry land pasture with a producer in the middle of the summer. And the one thing that we will find that is green in that pasture is some bird's foot trefoil. Bird's foot trefoil also has the benefit of fixing nitrogen because it's one of the legumes. And so it's returning some nutrients to your pasture. Um, some folks will be gasping in the background um, about plantain because plantain is on is sometimes like the bane of a lawn manager's existence. It can be a weed, um, and it's sort of a successful weed probably because uh, your lawn is not getting managed very well. And plantain is really deeply rooted, and so it is both persistent and can be highly productive, particularly when the grass is growing more slowly. And those are traits that we actually want in a resilient pasture, deeply rooted, persistent, and able to survive through a range of stressful conditions. Um, and so the, if I were thinking about um, an optimally resilient pasture that maybe got some irrigation on it, um, but we're, we had junior water rights and really could not rely on that irrigation water, I would be planting a, a tall fescue, chicory, plantain, bird's foot tree foil pasture for grazing. Probably wouldn't want to, um, We uh, chicory is not the best suited for cutting for hay. And I might leave that out if I was planning to cut some hay off of that pasture. Um, but the other two can are both suitable for both uh, grazing as well as for um, haying. Let's see, I've got a couple questions in the uh, chat box. If you had a pasture of mixed moisture regimes, uh, a mix of grasses might work well. A drought tolerant grass uh, populating the drier areas and rye grass populating the moisture areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Um, we think about planting a mixture of species for just that reason. There will be some niches in a pasture. Um, I am going to go out and say I am not recommending ryegrass for our pastures, even in the like best moistest places, um, unless you've like really manipulated the environment with like a bunch of shade cloth and are like misting out moisture to keep things cool. Uh, ryegrass will just not persist very well. It is inexpensive seed. It is fast growing, and I expect that fast growing nature is why it gets included in lots of pasture blends. Inexpensive seed is fast growing. You throw this seed out in the world. Um, tall fescue can take three weeks, four weeks to really show, and it'll be a pretty small plant. Um, ryegrass will pop up in maybe 10 days, and you won't go storming back to the co-op to say your grass seed was dead. And they'll all be muttering to themselves and like, well, it may be dead or may just still be growing and you don't know what you're looking for. But if they put some ryegrass in there, you'll see it growing and you won't go and make an angry trip to the co-op. Um, and so it's sort of to their benefit for the, from the seed salesman point of view. I'm just not sure it's to your benefit in year two and three and four in your pasture. It probably won't survive, at least here in the Rogue Valley, even in good soils and irrigated pastures. Um, and then a comment on 
uh, buffalo grass. Yeah, buffalo grass is a part of a group of other grass species that I've really not mentioned here, less my picture of corn. Um, the grasses that I've, picked, I've shown you here are ones that uh, evolutionarily came, uh, as well as these legumes and forbs, came from sort of the temperate zone, like the moderate latitudes of the world that um, have are a slightly cooler environment. Buffalo grass is an example of a tropical species. It has like a different mechanism of photosynthesis that uh, helps the plant be um, much less, uh, Heats, uh, it photosynthesizes more effectively at high temperatures. These grasses that we have, they really like it at like 75 degrees, 70, 75 degrees, are most happy. And that's why when we look at that bimodal growth curve of grasses, um, they sort of, they don't grow that well in the summer because we've got higher temperatures, though our nights are cool. And that is a benefit to us here uh, in the Rogue Valley. Whereas things like buffalo grass and other um, of these tropical grasses, corn, sorghum, millet, Sudan grass, um, Bermuda grass, Johnson grass, there are a whole suite of both annual and perennial tropical grasses. They can, um, they will grow well in our summer. They need moisture. Uh, with water, they will grow well. Um, like drop for drop of water, you'll actually probably grow more buffalo grass or sorghum or corn than you would of orchard grass or tall fescue, but they still need quite a bit of water. Um, the challenge with those, um, let me see, I don't know how to do this. Um, if I could go back like 12 slides, we'd go back to that bimodal growth curve. And what you'd find is that things like buffalo grass or these other tropical species um, will not grow at all until it gets properly hot. We would not want to plant them and to, uh, or expect them to grow until the end of May, and they would grow well through September, and you'd have a lot of growth in uh, July and August um, if they were well watered. But that's a relatively short window in our season that they're going to grow really well. There's a, definitely an option that you might grow uh, some warm season grasses in one or two of your uh, in your paddocks on your farm. But um, you would find that you had a lot of feed in the summer if those were well watered, but you'd have a long season when nothing at all grew. And when we say maybe for the first year, nothing at all would grow. But then during that long, cool season, when those tropical plants aren't growing well, you'd find that the weeds come in and those weeds would um, compete with that tropical grass. And it's, uh, there was research done here, um, here at SORIC a number of years ago, like in the 60s and 70s, where they looked at those, and they they concluded that our cool wet season is too long to make it worth the, per, the relatively short period of production that you get in the summer. And, um, and our summers are dry here, where if you are properly on the equator, you may get some moisture in the summer. So we still have to irrigate them. They will produce well um, and can be a component of a system You've really, I guess I see them um, being better suited to uh, production systems where people are out sort of farming some. If you were plowing up your pasture every few years to grow a crop of corn or a crop of barley to feed to your chickens, you might follow that uh, winter barley with a crop of sorghum Sudan grass that would be nice summer forage, one of these tropical species, and then you'd plant it back to perennial pastures. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of folks in the valley who have tried to interplant these warm season species like buffalo grass um, uh, into their cool season orchard grass, tall fescue pa pastures. They just don't persist very well. They can grow, just don't do great. Um, uh, yep, if you're curious about those, I'm happy to visit with you about them further. Um, and yep, it. Um, when you have when you have water in the when you have water in the summer, those can be good things to do. If you've got a dry summer, they they won't do that much. And then a comment here about uh, Paiute orchard grass. Yeah, Paiute orchard grass is a variety that I think was bred out of Utah, and there are lots of varieties of all these things, Paul fescue and orchard grass. And 
Um, there was a study that was done, I think, in Logan, Utah, by the USDA uh, ARS that has a station there, and they compared different orchard grass varieties, and that they found that uh, Paiute orchard grass, as they decreased the amount of irrigation that was uh, applied, they were able to maintain relatively more yield with less irrigation water for Paiute than they were able to for other orchard grass uh, varieties. And so of the orchard grasses, Paiute is uh, the most drought tolerant that I am aware of. There's not that much research that compares like one variety right next to the other of these forage species under different drought regimes. Um, but of the research there is, Paiute comes out on top. If I were um, thinking about a a drought tolerant blend and wanted to be experimental with my, I might add some Paiute orchard grass to my tall fescue and my chicory and plantain and bird's foot trefoil. But again, I sort of think the, even the Paiute orchard grass probably dies out uh, somewhat sooner under, under drought stress than does that tall fescue or these um, forbs that we're looking at. Another species of forage to consider is the queen of forages, and that is alfalfa. This is a picture that I took this past summer. This is that experiment that I had done where um, I was watering different amounts. I like discontinued that experiment two years ago because we were actually out of water, and so I just couldn't even do my irrigation experiment anymore. And um, if you've got like a knack for forage identification, there's still a little bit of um, tall fescue in here. If you get really close down there, there is like a little bit of green something where I'm spinning my cursor around. Um, that is um, birds for trefoil. We're just discussing birds for trefoil about sometimes being the only green thing in your pasture. And there, it's a green thing. It's kind of small, but it's a green thing. But then we have a big thing. This is like one alfalfa plant. Alfalfa is uniquely deeply rooted if we had been able to have this class in person, I would have asked the farm manager, Jake, to crank up the backhoe and we would have walked out into our alfalfa field and we would have dug a hole down as deep as the excavator could go, eight feet, 10 feet. And when we were down there, we would have still found alfalfa roots. Alfalfa is tremendously deeply rooted and can access deep moisture in a way that none of our other forage plants can. Um, in addition to having that deep root, has a real capacity to put on a lot of yield. This is probably a foot tall. It has had no water. Um, it has had no water on it. And I bet I took this photo in August of last year. Um, and it was mown to the ground in the spring after the uh, spring moisture had been used by the weeds out here. And this alfalfa still grew. It is very high quality, rich in protein, um, regrows vigorously. Um, after it's been cut or grazed, the one challenge that we have with alfalfa and why it is, um, or one of the challenges we have with alfalfa, despite her uh, pedestal as the queen of forages, is that it is so uh, rich a forage that an animal that is goes out onto an alfalfa pasture that's hungry, particularly when that alfalfa is uh, dewy in the morning, will snarf up so much alfalfa, and these leaves are so tender and rich in protein that it can cause a like foaming kind of like bubbliness in the rumen of this uh, animal. And when you have like foamy stuff in the rumen, a cow would be unable to like burp that up and expel that gas that is forming. And the pressure caused by this foamy gas that cannot be released from such a rich feed like alfalfa uh, can expand to the point of asphyxiating a ruminant and killing them. And not totally uncommon. Um, we would certainly, uh, while alfalfa can be a component of a grazing mix, uh, generally we would suggest that that's a relatively small proportion of a grazing mix, 30% or less. We would not want to turn animals that are starving hungry out into, an al into a field that has alfalfa in it, nor would we want to turn them out when that alfalfa was wet. If we were going to turn animals out and be very cautious about doing so, um, would um, make sure they had access to some like dry grass or some hay or um, some other material out there that was a little bit drier. Um, and we probably watch them pretty closely. Sheep are much less susceptible to the bloat caused by alfalfa uh, than are uh, cattle. And there's some like genetic predisposition. 
the folks over in New Zealand who tend to be pretty sophisticated grazers, they have adopted, um, they also have climate change challenges and increasingly dry summers. They share a sort of similar Mediterranean climate as we do here in, uh, in Western Oregon. They have said, um, we're going to overcome the bloat problem and have selected their cow herds to be more uh, uh, resistant to bloat. Um, they have uh, figured out ways to um, protect their sheep from the incidence of bloats because they say this is just too good an opportunity, too great a capacity to grow forage um, to not figure out a way to utilize it. And so they work on the animal side of those systems to be able to utilize alfalfa. Um, and there is like a little bit of a, um, not, not without good reason, but there's some stigma about grazing alfalfa and its potential to bloat animals uh, here in the United States. That is one of those things that sort of feel like as the climate changes and we continue to have real limitations and shortages on forage is one of those things we're gonna to need to address head on because we really can grow uh, biomass in a way like no other forage plant can when we grow alfalfa. Um, What benefits or supplements do forage, chicory, plantain, um, uh, or birds for trefoil provide to cows grazing on it uh, that are bred and expected to calve? Yeah, so um, there are some other benefits of these couple of species. And let's see. Um, They are beneficial, particularly the uh, chicory and plantain are very deeply rooted. And so they have access to moisture, not quite in, in as uh, a deep a way as alfalfa, but um, are very deeply rooted and will continue to grow. Um, that cow needs to eat every day. We need to have uh, green feed in front of her. Um, the uh, birds for trefoil in particular contains a com contains a suite of compounds called uh, condensed tannins and condensed tannins um, are compounds that bind up with nitrogen in the uh, rumen of the animal and can uh, where alfalfa can cause uh, animals to bloat because of the presence of these condensed tannins in birds for trefoil uh, it is a non bloating legume uh, Birds for trefoil also contains compounds that, um, here's a fancy word for you, and, and are anhelminthic. A helminth is a like a worm of sorts. And we know that internal parasites and worms can be problematic for a range of creatures, including our ruminant livestock. And we often need to treat those animals with dewormers or parasiticides in order to uh, keep, keep those animals healthy. Um, birds for trefoil can act as a natural dewormer. Um, and there's some other features in terms of other like sort of secondary compounds in these like herbaceous species that can be desirable for uh, livestock of all classes. Um, and so one other like option to consider is that we know that if we uh, beat up our perennial grasses, if they end up being too dry for too long, the perennials will die out. Um, and it can turn back into that Medusa head and um, foxtail and yellow star thistle and undesirable. But those are all annuals that grow on winter rains. And so we say, well, maybe if we can't beat them, we would join them. Why not just plant uh, annual, desirable annual species in the fall and use those winter rains to allow that to grow. And we'll just cut it for hay in the spring. It's not gonna grow through the summer without moisture, but a good option that is uh, that can be grown around here are these winter annuals. Um, and the winter annuals that I'm thinking of are sort of our cereal grains, but we just harvest them while they're still leafy. And so I'm talking about oats and barley, cereal rye, um, Triticale, which is the hybrid between uh, rye and wheat. Triticale, that's right. Um, there's one other. Oats, wheat, rye, barley, triticale. Th those are about the sweet. We can put legumes in them to do that nitrogen fixation we talked about earlier. Um, and can grow a lot of forage just using winter rainfall. To my mind, when somebody says, I've got EFU status, exclusive farm use, I need to, but I don't have water rights, and I need to do something that is a legitimate farming activity, I tend to think that growing these, uh, these winter annual forage species and cutting them for hay can be a viable, a viable enterprise. Um, 
I take some farming, we've got to plant them every year, and we've got to cut them for hay, um, rather than the perennials that just sort of like stick around and animals graze them. So there's some work and steel and diesel required, but can be a good way when there's not water rights, just use that winter rain, plant seeds in the fall, harvest a crop of hay in the spring. Um, then on to a little bit of grazing management. So we talked about soil, we talked about forage species, and a bit on to grazing management. And I've got 11 slides or fewer than that. And then we'll do some more Q&A and answer the things I've missed. Sometimes the good old boys will say, well, Gordon, there's plenty of grass out there. I'm going to keep them on the pasture until we can see some more dirt. Why not just graze it to the ground? And say, well, you can do that. That's not against the law. I will cannot stop you. But I think there are reasons, particularly as we think about protecting our uh, perennial grasses and their resilience to say, we shouldn't really graze these into the ground. It's not gonna be in our best long-term interest, even though it does, it may feel like it solves a problem of feeding that animal for tomorrow. Um, when we like graze really low, we sometimes call that overgrazing. It suppresses the growth of the forage and allows for weed invasion. It's hard on the roots of the plants and can kill them. Here's a little video we're gonna watch that came out of Kentucky, looking at orchard grass. Again, my favorite species, though not the most drought tolerant. Um, two pots of orchard grass, the one on the left-hand side had been clipped four times down to one inch. So pretty close to the ground, just like the nubbins are left in the previous month that they brought these pots out to take this slow motion uh, video. And then this one on the right-hand side was clipped just once and it was clipped down to three inches. And so both has more residual and was clipped less frequently. And so we can think about like a cow that is out on a pasture nipping at this grass like every day or every few days would force it to be pretty low. Whereas if we were controlling the grazing of that animal, we might be able to keep a higher level of residual. And let's watch it regrow for the next five days. So I think, I think we're there. And so this is same like species and variety of grass, same moisture um, environment, same soil fertility. All they did was manipulate the defoliation or grazing management prior to setting this thing going. And we don't really have a scale here, but I guess I suspect that the orchard grass that was less intense, intensely defoliated grew back four, or maybe six inches. And you just have one or two that um, uh, that grew back with the um, just one or two inches that grew back when that was more severely defoliated. And so thinking about the intensity with which we allow animals to graze or how low we set the mower if we're going to go mow hay or clip our pastures really can be important. And there's some a rule of thumb that we use that would be if you go out there and there's a bunch of grass in your pasture, we should graze about half of that and leave about half behind because so we want to leave roots and energy reserve, excuse me, uh, leaves and energy reserves uh, behind in that plant because it's a perennial. It wants to regrow. It just needs the resources to do so. And if we leave a little bit of a higher stubble, a greater residual, that plant will have a better capacity to do so. So uh, there's a really good comprehensive book that you might read called Pasture and Grazing Management in the Northwest. That's free online, written by OSU professors, as well as colleagues in Washington and Idaho. And here are some of those species that should be common. Tall fescue, orchard grass, perennial ryegrass. We just learned about uh, uh, birds for trefoil and alfalfa. If you're headed into that pasture, either to graze or to cut hay, in all those cases, we want six or eight inches of growth before we start to graze. We wanna have had that chance uh, for that plant to get tall and leafy um, and to get tall and leafy and to um, rebuild its reserves and be ready to be cut again uh, or nipped off by a cow. And then we want, if we're gonna mow or if we're gonna allow our animals to graze, we just wanna take about half of that. And so leave behind three to four inches of uh, that stubble, like we saw in that orchard grass example with those pots. We wanna leave three or four inches of stubble behind. So there are plenty of reserves for those um, 
to power the regrowth after that plant is cut or grazed off the first time. And this is really pretty important. We had a question a while ago, if I go zoom through here. When, um, Kath asks, when do we pull off the animals entirely? And I guess I would say when most of the farm just has three or four inches of forage left in those, in those, um, in those pastures. And this won't necessarily be even, but it is the rule of thumb. We don't want to graze this to the ground if we expect these plants to live. They are like real living creatures and need to have some leaf area. They store their energy reserves not in the roots. They store the energy reserves above the ground in that bottom uh, two to four inches of that grass plant. If we say like, well, Gordon, there's still some grass out there. I'm going to graze it to the ground. You can do that, but you should expect to kill these desirable perennial plants. Uh, it is one of those short-term trade-off things. It's not great feed for an animal to eat that bottom inch. They've got to eat a lot of dirt in the process and have their noses in the ground and are taking small bites and probably still are hungry. Um, I would say that when we get down to three to four inches, those animals are coming off the pasture or they're getting confined to one corner. And that's the time when we are bringing in feed we're feeding hay, we're selling animals, we're looking for across the landscape to find those greener pastures because I'm not grazing my nice perennial uh, perennial pastures down uh, into the dirt. We're gonna kill those perennials. Perennial pastures in this part of the world can last decades. Uh, we can also kill them in like a single season. And it is about our choices in management uh, and they become, they're pretty resilient when things are cool and wet and are really, can be really pretty sensitive when things get dry. And so particularly in a drought situation, we really don't want to graze too low because those plants are already stressed, their uh, energy reserves are limited and you can kill them. And so we take animals off the pasture when they're down to three or four inches. We got to leave some uh, stubble behind to protect that plant. I wanted to see if uh, this morning I was noodling around to see if I could find an example from um, about how roots respond to different types of defoliation, because that's important in terms of accessing water for those plants, and found a good study that I cited uh, in my dissertation from 1930. Some fellows from uh, the Aberystwyth Research Station in Wales uh, went out and looked um, looked at some orchard grass plants, again, one of my favorites. Um, in this case, they measure roots on that, uh, those orchard grass plants. Um, one treatment was to cut those uh, orchard grass plants to ground level really close um, every three weeks. And they found that when they dug them up, they had really scanty roots. When they cut them to six inches every three weeks, they had more than twice the, uh, the weight of roots. When they cut them just twice a season, sort of like they were haying, they had um, more roots still. And when they were cut once a season, they had more roots still uh, than that. And it's not necessarily the end of the world that this is plant over here that's only been cut once a season and has more root mass than this one that's been cut to six inches. This plant is not less happy than that one. It's not like better or worse, but um, because they've sort of forced these plants that are cut more frequently, kind of like your lawn, to stay pretty small. And so that plant that only grows this tall really only like needs this much roots. Um, a plant that is this tall is going to need much more roots in order to support that. And having um, a grass that's sort of managed like your lawn, where we cut it pretty close every week, it's going to have a shorter root system. And when the situation is good, not necessarily a bad thing. But when if we've been watering this nice and evenly like you do your lawn, you're, you can tolerate having a short root system, but what's going to happen when the irrigation gets shut off, when there's no more water coming down the ditch, when the summer is particularly hot and particularly dry? In that circumstance, I kind of hope my plants have deeper roots, are exploring a larger volume of soil rather than a smaller one, so that they've got a better chance of surviving through that drought and continuing to produce a little bit. And so, that's just like one more reason we follow this take half, leave half kind of uh, situation. And how do we pull this off? Um, we really need to do this other part of the Andre Bozan quotation from the beginning. This whole thing we've been talking about is helping the grass to grow, but then we need to guide the cow to some degree in how to harvest that grass. Here are three examples of grazing systems. Um, 
One, which is pretty common, is that we're going to turn those animals out in the spring into a pasture and allow them to graze. They all move through the pasture, um, grazing different species, really just to their preference. We're not really guiding them in where they go. They will wander around and graze that pasture. What we'll find is that um, the cows keep going, or the horses, or I don't know if chickens will do this, but I just don't know that much about chicken grazing behavior, um, will come back to the same places and they will regraze the same little tender, fresh shoot that just grew. And they'll sort of avoid the places that have gotten taller. There'll be more stems there and some more weeds. And they'll tend not to graze those. And you'll find this sort of like lumpy, uneven uh, matrix. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this in your pasture, where there's some areas that are grazed just within a, an inch or two of the ground, lower than I'm suggesting, and other places that are like two feet tall. You can use the mower to fix that to some degree, but it is just the nature of grazing behavior in pastures that animals really like the grass that grew like three or four days ago and is just an inch tall, they'll nip that off. And the grass that grew like six weeks ago, rougher, uh, browner, less tasty. And they're gonna sort of just keep, continue this cycle of grazing the lush green stuff and not grazing the tall stuff. And so the way that we overcome that is by forcing it, by forcing animals into smaller spaces, um, they're going to be apt to, to eat less selectively. And so we might take this big pasture and divide it up into four. And now we can concentrate that defoliation and grazing into just one quadrant, 25% of the area, and we allow the other 75% to rest, to rebuild its energy reserves, to allow those roots to penetrate more deeply into the soil. Um, and that is can definitely work. And some folks who get fancy about it want even more control and want to move their animals just every uh, couple of days. <clears throat> and so we'll subdivide into uh, a number of really small paddocks. I've seen farms that have these subdivided pastures that are divided into like 100 little spots and animals get moved every day and just cycle around from one to the next to the next. And they only return our uh, if we're going to make a decision about moving the animals to the next pasture. We just want to make sure there was enough grass there. And this is another one of those moments when we say, when do we fully take the animals off the pasture? I want to take the animals fully off the pasture. When I look and say, I want to move them either to their next quadrant or their next 24th of my pasture. And I go out there and I say, yikes, there aren't six or eight inches of forage. It's not really regrown. And that'll happen in the summer when there's in a really dry summer. There won't, the grass won't regrow, and we don't want to take half of just four inches of stubble. We really needed it to regrow and replenish its reserve. That is a moment. We say the grass is not growing. It is time to feed hay. And I guess I, I like these subdivided systems for feeding hay, because then I'm going to say, I'm just going to pick one little area, and I'm going to feed hay in that area, and we're going to like beat it to smithereens. We're probably going to kill the perennial grasses. We're going to turn some of it to dust. Um, but I'm going to protect the other 96% of my pasture by doing that in one little confined area. If I go and feed hay in the corner of this pasture, these cows are going to continue to wander around and continue to nibble at that, that stubble that is there, stressing the perennial plants across this whole uh, quadrant while they're eating the hay as well. And so it's sort of like the worst of both worlds. They're killing your perennials and you're spending money and resources on the hay that um, is being fed. Um, and so allowing subdividing pastures allows for control of grazing and the and rest and regrowth of that forage, and it can protect those plants during drought. All right, some key points. We want to protect the stubble to maximize the chances of recovery during drought. We always want to protect those bottom two to four inches of our forage plants. This is even more the case when things are stressful and it is hot and dry. When it, there's not enough feed in front of us in terms of what the animals are going to eat tomorrow, they're starting to get towards that three inch stubble height. We need to get rid of animals or feed stored feed. Those are the options. We're out of balance. There's too much demand for how of for feed, for how much supply there is, we have to fix that one way or the other, either get rid of animals or bring more feed in. Um, reducing irrigation uh, will reduce forage yields. It's just a linear thing. If you have the water to put on, uh, it is can be beneficial to do it. Um, if you don't have the water, uh, in many cases that is out of our control and we need to um, work on either destocking or feed stored feed. We want to um, 
fertilize based on soil test recommendations, working on getting that uh, potassium in particular up into a out of the low ranges so it is adequate. We're being cautious if nitrogen fertilizer of any sort is being added because we want to be considerate of the potential for nitrate accumulation and toxicity. And we want to think if we're uh, planting perennial forage species, things like tall fescue, chicory, plantain, and uh, bird's foot trefoil for our like uh, moistest of dry pastures or for those variably irrigated, irrigated in good years and not in bad years. Those are really a desirable set of species to be thinking about um, for pastures um, in this part of the world. I've got a couple of resources that might be interesting. You can, we learned about how to do QR codes a little while ago. Um, and you could scan those. Uh, perhaps Rachel will have me send you, send her these um, slides. And in which case you could take these home. You could also just take a photo of this, um, type in those words, Washington State, University of California, two good resources. Um, looks like we have about 10 minutes left. It's approaching eight o'clock. Um, as you're thinking of questions, I have one more thing that I would like to, to do just in the last couple of minutes. Um, the Oregon State got asked by the state legislature to really be as supportive as we can in terms of drought and natural disasters for farmers and landowners. And uh, the associate dean for extension this past fall said, Folks, when you're out teaching this spring, we'd like you to ask this question. When it comes to drought or natural resource or natural disasters, which policies like government policies, water rights, or how your irrigation districts work, or actions around water or technical assistance would be most uh, oh, would most effectively help your farm? And so as you're thinking about questions to ask, I'm gonna hop us one back one more time over to this thing. And if you feel like there are things that the government of Oregon, that our irrigation districts, that our legislature could do, that we could do here at the Extension Service, somebody else could do somewhere, um, some like squirrely law that should be changed or um, something that's like problematic, if you feel like it and want to type this in, I think I've said it to be anonymous, um, a couple of words, a short sentence. I'll compile anything that comes in here in the next few minutes um, and pass it up the chain and it'll uh, make it back into some uh, reporting that's being done by the university on drought and natural disasters and really what the opportunities are, um, opportunities are to improve those things and see a way forward. I know I, I certainly am curious about dr dry land forage species and um, what other options there are on those questions of like, what's the most drought tolerant variety of tall fescue would be an experiment that we could do. And actually it turns out, come talk to me in a year. I just planted this past fall, some different drought tolerant tall fescues to evaluate those, the drought, most drought tolerantiest of the drought tolerant tall fescues. Um, yeah, and then there's a, a uh, a question um, in the chat box about, can I touch on when and how to seed pastures uh, with these suggested forage species? When? Easy question. We want to do that in the fall. We're going to plant baby forage plants, um, and we have a relatively mild winter here on the west side. The summer is the stressful time of year, and so I want that baby pasture plant to have as long a cool and wet season to grow roots and get well established before the hot dry summer. I want to plant just at first rain, uh, at rain first rain when first rainfalls come in the fall. Um, that's when I would do that, um, and would, it would take one of two approaches. Um, would either think about totally like plowing up my pasture. Sometimes things get so weedy that really is best to start fresh. And I want to go through with a plow or a disc or, and a harrow and turn over that soil and turn it into sort of garden bed uh, kind of environment where it is free from weeds, it is fluffy, it is firm. Um, and to, I would apply fertilizer at that point or compost or organic material probably would take a soil test at that time. Um, it would plant, uh, plant seeds either by sprinkling and broadcasting or using a seed drill. One of the things about planting forages um, is their seeds are really small. Anytime we're planting, we wanna make sure that we really press those seeds into the soil. 
And so if we're broadcasting or even if we're using a seed drill, I like to come through with a roller afterwards of some sort, ideally a heavy roller, and press those seeds into the soil surface. Um, another option, uh, particularly if you're in Jackson County and many folks, um, and we're in Jackson County, it sounds like we have, have the benefit of having a really excellent soil and water conservation district, again, located in uh, Central Point. They have a couple of what are called no-till drills, where if your pasture is just kind of iffy, it's not like totally gone where we need to kill everything, but we just want to add some desirable species. There was a question earlier about potentially overseeding alfalfa into a mixed pasture. Thinking about using a no-till drill might be an option to do that. It's a pretty heavy kind of planting tool that has like sharp coulters or knives on it that can cut through um, existing thatch plants that are there, drop seeds into this a little slot of bare soil, and then roll that closed. Um, that can be uh, a really successful way of approaching things. Sometimes weeds can be more of a challenge in those systems, because again, we've got like tiny little baby forage plants that have just sprouted with the first fall rains and uh, neighboring them are some like sort of established other plants. Um, and sometimes those existing established plants can be kind of competitive. That's one of those times, if I'm gonna do a, a no-till seeding, that is one of the few times we would break the rule about grazing really close. I kind of do wanna stress any existing vegetation that's out there so that, th that uh, we'll have a better chance of winning in the competition. My baby new seedling with the existing established seed, seed oh, oh, this, it, existing established plants that a nice tight grazing or a close clipping with a mower will stress out the existing plants and have a better chance to recruit those new baby uh, seedlings up into the cohort of productive plants in my pasture sward. Um, it looks like there are some good comments coming in. I really appreciate folks uh, answering those questions. If you want to uh, think about this and write me an email or write Rachel an email, um, uh, feel free to do that after the fact and I will compile any of those things and pass them up the chain. And then there's a, a question from uh, about the best recommendations for forage and uh, forbs for pastured chickens, uh, given that uh, chickens scratch the soil. Um, you are right. The chickens scratch the soil, and depending on how you manage them, a lot of chicken coops that I see, if they're just like fenced in one location, they sort of turn into bare ground after not too long. I tend to like um, some mixture or some mosaic. Um, if I can have a couple of chicken areas, if I have like three or four chicken areas, some of those I'm going to plant to uh, annual species, things like annual ryegrass or the oats or barley or peas things like crimson clover, those will get planted in the fall at the same time we plant perennials. They'll grow on winter rain and come the spring, that is prime poultry feed. Um, uh, also perennials, like tall fescue, is like one of my favorites just because it's really hardy. It is like the most, um, the most apt not to be totally destroyed by a chicken, but sort of in the same way that we rotate an, um, ruminants around a rotationally grazed pasture. I really like the idea of intensive grazing, and then rest for a poultry uh, a poultry run, where we've got a couple of areas. If we allow them to, they'll graze it to the ground and kill everything and turn it to dirt. But if we can leave them out there for a few days or a few weeks, let them clip through and scratch at a lot of things, and then move them on to a different area, there'll be a chance for those, um, those species to regrow to, um, to some degree. And some combination of uh, annuals out there that are quick growing and the perennials that are a little bit hardier uh, are good options um, are good options for poultry. I could take a look at um, I could take a look at um, in my closet for this like 1940s uh, poultry pasture publication and see if there's anything exciting in there and uh, send it off to you. Um, so a, a comment of, uh, since we missed planting seeds in the fall, can we still try to plant them now? You certainly can try. Um, I would do it tomorrow, as soon as possible. Um, uh, we can do spring planting. We want to do it as early in the year as possible. And I would not spend a huge amount of money on my seeds, because I guess I would say kind of risky. Um, 
and particularly for tall fescue. As I keep singing its uh, praises because it is so drought tolerant and resilient, it is just a little bit slow in getting going. Um, if I were going to do some overseeding, it'd probably be with the legumes. It might be with chicory and plantain. I would use orchard grass. And now that I've told you not to use perennial rye grass, if I just want to like thicken up my pasture for a couple of years and don't mind if it thins out and I need to reseed every three or four years, I might actually use perennial rye grass. It won't last forever. It's not going to give me a good, uh, really like drought resilient cover. But if I just need to like sort of thicken things up and I'm just sort of like making bets that the snowpack is good this year and maybe the drought won't be too bad and I can find some inexpensive seed and it doesn't like, um, don't have to like plow up the whole farm in order to do it. Um, the rye grasses have the benefit of being pretty quick out of the ground. We were talking about that being a reason that that's why they're included in the seed mixes. Um, Pete has a question about do native grasses or uh, forbs make also make good forage? They certainly can make good forage. They tend to be very sensitive. Our whole landscape was covered with native grasses and forbs, and it just took a couple of decades of poorly managed grazing to kill those out to a great degree. We still definitely find our native grasses around, but so much of what would have been a native grass, perennial grass landscape has become an invaded annual grass landscape because they're just not quite as quick to regrow that the orchard grass and tall fescue and rye grass and the clovers and trefoil and alfalfa are species that are grown all over the world just because they're really pretty good about being grazed and regrowing and tolerating this on and off cycle that happens over the courses of multiple times a year where native grasses often can just tolerate being grazed once or maybe twice during a year and really require much more land. Um, I tend not to recommend them as the base of a sort of like pasture system Certainly in terms of like ecological restoration, we want to think about incorporating uh, perennial grasses and those can be grazed, but it'll sort of be using like grazing as a tool to help manage the grasses rather than grazing as a tool to feed the livestock, if that makes sense. Um, Rachel points us to Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District for consultation on irrigation upgrades. Um, I mentioned the management of irrigation just about zero this evening. We could teach you a two hour long class on irrigation management uh, across a lot of crops and garden things. We'll have to save that for another time. Um, but yes, Paul DiMaggio is an irrigation engineer and can help you think through um, irrigation challenges and system upgrades. They have equipment to rent out, including the um, including the um, no-till drill. And let's see, what else did I miss in terms of questions? It is 8.02. What other questions do we have? Thank you folks for uh, doing this, this little poll exercise with me. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I think you'll still be able to access that Slido. Um, if you wanna enter some things in there, uh, also, you could send me an email or um, send Rachel an email if you've got other thoughts you want passed up the chain on uh, drought and natural disaster, wildfire, extreme heat, climate change, those kind of things. We're trying to collect a lot of information across the, the state and pass that up so we can have a well-advised set of rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gordon. That was amazing. That was great. <laughs> What a lot of wonderful information. Um, yeah, I have a list here of about three ideas for more two hour classes, kind of scaffolding out on this topic. Um, but as always, really informative, very clear. It's amazing that you can say so much about pasture. It's just incredible. <laughs> I know, and we're just scratching the surface. Let me put my email yes. in the chat box because I would welcome mm -hmm. emails or phone calls. Um, and Tate, I know I owe you an email back and a farm visit that I've been ignoring. My apologies, but I do read my email and I know when I've neglected to reply to people and would welcome phone calls or emails. And, and sometimes I'm in a perfect moment to come check out what's going on in your pasture. And other times I am so swamped by what the university asks us to do that I'll say, not this instant, or you're going to have to apologize because it'll take me two weeks to get back to you, but I will. And I am delighted to visit with you on these kind of questions and lots of other things and see how we can help. All right. Very good. Thanks, everyone, for joining. 
I will, uh, maybe Gordon will give me some of those links, those QR codes, they'll, they'll be in the recording, so you'll always be able to go to those as well if Gordon has linked those. Um, but, yep, in a day or so, you'll get a recording of this, and you can share it with your neighbors. <laughs> Thanks so much, Gordon. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Thanks for the great questions and discussion and engagement. Have an excellent night. Good luck.